Hey to my Growing in the Gospel friends, I'm Pastor Kerry, and you've clicked play on something very special. We're going off script today. We're going to do a revelation question and answer session with my friend Tom Cody from the Watchman River Channel. So this is uh, in line with our normal study of the book of Revelation that we're doing on this channel, but today is a little different. Tom reached out to me recently. He's a great friend, part of my church, and he said, let's do an interview, and I'm just going to throw you a bunch of questions from the book of Revelation, questions that I get asked a lot, and uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll do this. So we sat down and did this interview. It's an hour, but we split it in half, and so this video is part two. I'm going to link in the description to part one. If you enjoy this or portion of this or you want to go watch that one first, they're both live. And so uh, you can click and go over to Watchman River and watch the first half. And this is the last half of Revelation Questions and Answers uh, with Pastor Kerry and my friend Tom. You will enjoy this. Let's jump into the interview. Hey, guys, it's Tom with Watchman River. And uh, if you guys caught part one of this video, which I don't even know what it's going to be called yet, but it'll be called something. But I'm sitting here with my pastor, Pastor Kerry Schmidt, and I'm very, man, part one was such a blessing. Just asking questions about end times and revelation because he's going through it right now at our church, uh, Manual Baptist Church in Newington, Connecticut. And it's been such a blessing that I wanted to continue with these questions And these are just questions that in my past I've had and questions that I see in the comments. So I just thought we would address these. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Do you have another snack you want to suggest? (laughs) Oh, you caught me off guard. (laughs) Uh, My go-to is just a really good cheeseburger and homemade French fries and preferably in and out burger, but they're not on the East Coast. They're not on the East Coast. I've been to them. but They're They're amazing. All right, well, you guys heard that. So that's not really a recommendation if you're on the East Coast, but if you're on the West Coast, it's a recommendation. All right, here we go, let's start. So, will the Jews believe Antichrist is Messiah? That's the end of the question? That's the that's like my first part. I have another part to the question. I was gonna say, the one yeah. you sent me is longer than that. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't, believe that they're going to fall for it. Maybe in the early part, they might uh, okay. start to wonder, but um, but I don't think they're going to fall for it. Okay. All right. Because that my, the second part of my question was, I've heard many people say, all the Jews are going to think that the Antichrist is their Messiah. And I've always thought, well, if they, if they think he's their Messiah, then when he enters the temple at the halfway mark in the tribulation and says, stop the sacrificing, worship me, I'm God. Why wouldn't they fall at their feet? Well, fall at his feet and go, you are Messiah and worship him. Right. So um, here's where we can connect dots. This is a little fuzzy, admittedly, uh, but it seems to me um, the one of the primary purposes of the tribulation and most dispensational premillennial scholars agree on this point, that the primary purpose of the tribulation is God drawing Israel back to himself, Uh, that he is working towards the end when all of his promises to Israel will ultimately be fulfilled. The millennial kingdom is the fulfillment of all those Old Testament passages of that perfect, ideal, messianic kingdom. Mm. Okay. So those seven years before the lead up to it, it makes sense that this is the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, right? That last seven years. Um, So it's God expressing in very specific terms the gospel to to Jewish people of the time. Now, um, the details, you know, Paul says in Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. Now, I don't believe that means that every Jewish person that ever lived will be saved. I believe he's talking about a moment in time when, and I do believe this, every living, every alive Jewish person will finally believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, when you connect the dots of what's going on in Daniel and Ezekiel and in Revelation, you you see God, well, chapter 7, 144,000 Jewish witnesses are saved. Yes. And God calls them the first fruits. And he calls them his servants. 
that are following the lamb everywhere he goes. So doing the work of God all over the world and propagating the gospel. They, I believe they are saved possibly because of the preaching of those two witnesses, which many believe are Moses and Elijah. Yeah. But either way, they're just two supernatural visitors who are preaching the gospel. Um, and, and I think connecting dots for all of the Jewish people in supernatural ways. And, you know, Jesus said, and it was said in other places, Jews are always looking for a sign. They've always yeah. got to have proof, right? Yeah. Well, the tribulation is going to be a time of epic proof. And all the dots that they've disconnected through their mystical interpretation of scripture, these two witnesses, these 144,000 witnesses are going to connect all these dots. And, and I just believe there's going to be a massive harvest culminating at that millennial kingdom. And at some point in there, maybe towards the end, I don't really know. Uh, at some point, God's going to fulfill that promise that all Israel is going to believe wow. in Jesus as the Messiah. So it's pretty amazing to think about the millennial kingdom that we as believers, as the church will rule and reign. Um, you know, it, it's, it's mind blowing to think we're going to be in the administration Mm. on this earth, not the new one, this one, after the tribulation, Jesus ruling and reigning, setting up his administration, living believers in their natural bodies, still with their sin natures. Yeah. Yep. And believing Jews and Gentiles will be transitioned into that new administration, that kingdom, and for a thousand years, and it's a thousand years, we're back in time. So it's a thousand years the way we're experiencing time now yes, for us. Yes, That's we're what I thought. 1,000 years of we're in our new bodies, ruling and reigning in the administration. Do we sleep here at night or do we go I up to I believe we do. I, we're here. I mean, <laughs> I, why wouldn't we? You know, um, we're, we got perfect bodies in a new creation, but it's still this creation. It's still, it's not a new creation yet. Yeah. It's a new kingdom. It's yep. the millennial kingdom, and and there's still sinful people. So we're we're carrying out the will of God in a perfect kingdom, global kingdom. Ugh. But all these believers are having families and procreating over a thousand years, and all of their descendants have to choose Jesus. Um, I'm really off track at this point, but it's going to be amazing. Yeah. So I think I don't believe that the Jewish people fall for the Antichrist. Okay. I, I believe that there's a massive harvest and at some point all of them believe in Jesus, at those alive. Yeah, wow, okay, thank you. All right, this is a question I don't think there's an answer to scripturally, but do you think, all right, first I'll read it, Isaiah 17, one, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. You think that's before the rapture or after the rapture? I don't know. You just don't know, right? It's one no. of those people ask me all the time, and I'm I always say, I just you don't you don't know. It's conjecture. What we can say for sure, and this is what I, I, I say to people a lot. The Bible tells us that things happen, that God will do this, that God did this. And it there are many places it doesn't tell us why or how or when. It just says that, that mm -hmm. this is gonna happen. <clears throat> And th that just means that's what God wants us to know. Yeah. Um, so it could happen in some conflict before then. It could happen as a part of that Ezekiel 37, 38 war, that Gog and Magog. Yep. It, there are some that believe it's the fulfillment of Psalm 2 at the beginning of the millennial reign when Jesus finally triumphs over all the nations hmm. um, and breaks them with a rod of iron, you know. Wow. So it could be anywhere along the way. But I know this, I'm certain it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You know, God has said it. And I always say God's word gave us more than we deserve. Like we, like yeah, he gave us true. so much. Yes. So much. It's such an informed faith. There's a lot that we don't have. There's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot of gaps that yeah. he never filled in. Yeah. You know, the storyline of scripture is very specific. It's very pointed to Jesus and then really out of Jesus and then back to Jesus, right? All the way, Old Testament points to Jesus, New Testament out of Jesus, and then we end up at the throne of Jesus. Yeah. 
So it's it's one storyline, one straight line to Jesus, um, and all and and the the nuances that we need to know. But what I love about it is, it's so woven with supernatural realities Amen. that it's undeniably supernatural. The story, and it's it's extremely verifiable. Mm. There's so much more evidence for this worldview, for this this version of reality, the logos, you know, that Jesus is truth in a person, um, than there is for any other worldview. Yeah. Every other worldview, in my opinion, you have to throw your brain totally in the trash. Yep. And the funny thing is that's what we're accused of. That's what we're accused of. Yeah. They're like, oh, you're brainless if you believe this. It's... I also love how the Old Testament unfolds to the new and the new mm -hmm. is infolded into the old. And it's just those references back and forth that are just so yeah. powerfully. I'm incredible. trying to cover some of that in what I'm doing. The one year Bible journey, you yeah. know, trying to connect the two and show the narrative, this, the full storyline. It's, it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing. All right, let's hop over to revelation 22 verse 18 and 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Does this warning apply to just the book of Revelation? Or do you believe this is to the entire Bible? So there's a, there's, there's a principle of context and a principle of application that I want to talk about. Okay. Because the the word is her hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is the word for the, 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 the ground rules for interpretation, for biblical interpretation. In other words, what are the guidelines that we go by yeah. for letting the Bible speak, letting it say what it says and not bending it or shaping it the way we want. Yeah. And one of the foundational rules of hermeneutics is context. So... The first, print, the first principle of context says this applies contextually to the book that John is writing, to the book of Revelation. In context, it's speaking specifically to this message, this letter. Don't anybody change it. Don't anybody mess with it. Yeah. Okay, well, we have the benefit of, you know, being 2,000 years removed or you know, 1,900 years removed from this moment. So we have we have the benefit of a of a uh, whole scripture canon that's been brought together by the work of the spirit of god yes in the early life of the church and so the principle of application is that is this principle of not changing the word of god mentioned elsewhere in scripture and the answer is yes hmm. so Principally, we can apply the idea that we don't mess with God's words and that yeah. we approach God's words with reverence and respect and awe and we don't bend them or twist them. We can apply that to the whole scripture. So I hope that makes sense. It totally makes Contextually, sense. Contextually, it's specifically speaking about revelation, but principally it can be applied to the okay. whole Bible. Cool. All right. This is just this is just because it's such a great thing to fun thing to talk about. Revelation chapter four speaks of the throne room in heaven and i just want to say can you imagine we're sitting there and we see john enter in and he's getting the revelation like we're seeing what we've read about our whole lives and we're there can you imagine our reaction what that's going to be like <laughs> so i'll tell you my first thought on this okay i wrote this down I don't think our attention is going to be on John. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. You're, there. you're before the throne room of Jesus and all the spectacular sights and lights. And, and, and you notice a guy with a pen over in the corner. <laughs> I don't know. Somehow I picture I'll be looking at John and Jesus is going to smack me upside the head very lovingly. You know, Tom, Tom. Are you OCD? Are you the kind of person that notices the, 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 the weird detail over you're gonna, in the corner? You know what's going to happen? I'm going to stand near you and you're going to just be like Jesus and I'm going to be like, look, look, look Tom, pay attention. John's over there. <laughs> you're missing John. He's got a pen. I'm going to be like, Tom, it's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I know John's over there. I've read that book. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you that. what's going to, to me, the bigger question is, will we, um, did John see us? Mm. 
Yeah. Like that's a little trippy. Yeah. Because we were in the scene. Yep. Where John was, you know, we were yeah. in that crowd. It's an innumerable number of people, right? But uh, that's that's pretty cool. I'm going to have, I don't know if you've ever heard me say this, but I'm going to have long golden flowing hair in heaven. <laughs> and John might, he might look over and go, that's the guy with the hair. If you have long go <laughs> golden hair in heaven, I'm going to say, Tom, is there a barber? Because I'm going to take you to a barber. <laughs> well, I keep, I keep saying what's going to happen is I've teased about this so much that the Lord's going to give me like... You know those little play school dolls with like the click on it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have like the ugliest plastic, hair. <laughs> plastic hair set. All right. All right. You're gonna um, be a Lego character. <laughs> All right. Revelation 20. We are trouble. You know, <laughs> honestly, if I don't know, I mean, <laughs> we maybe shouldn't do this too often. <laughs> we're laughing more than we're teaching. Anyway, <laughs> go true, ahead. But you know, it's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Well, Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Mm. So we're in heaven when the tears are wiped away. What are those tears? What, what, what do you think are those tears at that time? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I uh, can't say for sure because the Bible doesn't say. Um, and I know that, yeah, there are tears in heaven to begin with, and then they're wiped away, and then they're no more. And so, to me, it seems logical that they would be tears of regret and tears of joy. <clears throat> so, uh, the Bema seat, wood, hay, stubble, I'm going to regret. You know, I'm going yeah. to regret. But I'm also going to, I think also, when, when do you, you cry when you are at loss, you cry when you're grieving, you cry uh, when you're sad, when you have regrets, you cry when you're joyful. Yeah. And I mean, I, I Sunday morning, you were in this first service. Yeah. I stood in the back. I mean, I was, I couldn't get myself together. I was crying through the songs, you know, wow. and sometimes it just hits. Well, what's it going to be in the presence of Jesus? I think I'm just going to fall apart. I'm just. Wow. So my, I think my tears will be a mixture of regret and overwhelming joy. Yeah. You know. So question. See, I've always thought, are we going to be at the great, great white throne judgment? They're watching that, or do you think that's a... Oh, so you're wondering, or maybe, wondering maybe other tears. tears then. Maybe we'll see people that we loved that just wouldn't turn. Maybe. But so here's what I want to say about that, because one of your questions kind of brushed up against, yes. you know, what will, what will the idea be of those we knew on earth that we loved that, that did not believe. So they're not there with us. This, this, by the way, is a huge question I get yeah. in comments. Yeah. You know, will we remember our loved ones Yeah. for eternity? Yeah. And there's a question behind the question. So I don't want to think, and this is just me thinking out loud. I, okay. I don't have a Bible verse to support this. I just have the heart of God that I understand from Scripture. I, it's hard for me to think that we wouldn't remember them because they're a part of our story. Yeah. Okay. But in remembering them, we know in heaven, we will in no way be sorrowful. We will in no way, at least beyond the drying of our tears, there'll be no more sorrow. There'll be there'll be no pain. And so when I think of the, the, the way we think of pain on this side of heaven, yeah. of losing a loved one, or, I, you know, like I can imagine someone thinking, I, well, I don't want to go to heaven if so-and-so that I love is not yeah, there. My child is not there. Right, or, or yeah. someone I love. And I can understand that perspective from an earthly limited human understanding that this existence is all we know. What that tells me is my heart is very wrapped up into my earthly relationships so much so that I can't really differentiate. But I know this in heaven, whatever our context of former relationships, I will not be sorrowful. I will not be in, uh, in a state of insufficient emptiness or loss or um, incompleteness in any way. Mm. What is it 
what okay so i love my wife dana what is what, i love her as a person i love her as an individual i love her as a as the daughter of god um and she com she brings a completion to me she's the gift of god to me she's the grace of god to me and so i can't imagine my life without her and i don't even want to imagine that yeah. but um i know jesus is better and so whatever it means to be in his presence and know him perfectly and be like him and be welcomed into that heart of things, it will make me so complete and so full and so joyful and every need met that it will, I guess that what I'd say to the very least, it would totally recontextualize, it reframe all of my earthly associations and all of my earthly loves. Mm -hmm. with a higher supreme love. So I hate to say that we won't remember them. That sounds kind of dystopian. Like, we're, you know, we're going to wipe your mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I know we won't be grieving either. Yeah. And I know that's not a good answer to the question. But, you know, Jesus said to us, let not your heart be troubled. There you go. He doesn't want us to worry about stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. He really doesn't. Yeah. That's good. Okay. <laughs> this is kind of a silly question, but it's it, this is one of my questions. Okay. Why are there gates in the new heaven? Uh, who are they keeping out? <laughs> you know, the big walls and gates. And like, yeah. Well, the simple answer to your question is they're not keeping anybody out because there's no enemies to keep out. Yeah. And Revelation says... Uh, that the gates never close. Did you know that? Now that I'm thinking about it, yeah. They never close. The gates of, this is Revelation 21, 25. The gates of it shall not be shut at all wow. by day, for there shall be no night there. Wow. <laughs> so John says, it's interesting. He says, they never close the gates during the day. Oh, and there's no night. Yeah, so that's forever. <laughs> it's that forever day. So these gates are memorials. They are probably beautiful, amazingly beautiful. And, yeah. and, um, they are approaches. They are, they've got the 12 tribes. There's 12 gates there. There's angels you know, at the entrances. Um, but here, so here's the, the new Jerusalem will be living out in the eternal state in reality, what ancient Israel was living out in like stick figure drawings. Hmm. Okay, so your, your kids ever draw a picture of you yeah. when they were four? Oh, yeah. And it's a stick figure and, you know, funny hair and funny features. And they're, you're like, who is that? Always bald. Who Always is, yeah. Bald, yeah, who is that? And you're like, that's you, you know? <laughs> and you look at it, it's the most hideous thing. So I was doing my video for the one-year Bible program today. I was talking about all Leviticus, and we get bogged down in Leviticus. You know, the tabernacle, the laws, the ceremonies, the sacrificial system, the priests. But it's, it's figures, it's stick drawings mm. of an eventual reality. Because one day we will be going from our dwelling places into the new Jerusalem. And we will be participating in feasts and celebrations and worship. We'll come and go from that place. And, and we'll walk through those gates into that city and be welcomed into the presence of Jesus. So all of the ancient feasts and all the ancient celebrations and the temple and the Holy of Holies and the mercy seat... It's all going to be there. You know, the wow. tree of life and the, uh, the, the the water of life. It's just amazing. It's hard to imagine. It's my yeah. own. Wow. Okay. Why is Satan released for a short time at the end of the millennial reign of Christ? I, I think I know, you know, but why, why would you say Satan so is released? So let me ask you. Let, let, you answer first. All right. Well. I'm I've thinking, got stuff I want to say, but I want to... There are many people born during that mm -hmm. thousand years, and we all have free will, and we all have to choose Jesus to get eternal life. So I just feel like the people that live through the thousand years, they have to make that choice for Jesus. They've lived with him for a thousand years. It's been perfection. Yeah. And they somehow, you know, they'll go to the enemy, but I think it's free will. I think you have to choose Jesus in order to get... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that is, that's that's one of two or three things I was going to say. Okay. Um, this so, is a question I get a lot. Why? Why, why in the world would God do that? Why has He come back? You yeah. Know? Well, 
you start here, okay? Every single event that God records is necessary. It's a necessary event to fully complete his redemptive plan for creation and for eternity. Whether we know how or why is secondary. Hmm. He wouldn't be doing it if it weren't absolutely necessary, okay? So the times, what I would caution your listeners is the times where you don't understand something, we do one of two things with our lack of understanding. We either fold our arms like, well, why is God doing that? Like we know better. Yeah. Yeah. And and if he'd listen to us, he could save himself a lot of trouble. Yeah. Which is so presumptuous. Yeah. The other path through these woods is to go, Wow, he's so much bigger than I understand. Mm. I wonder why he even told me this. So, you know, we need to be careful with impugning God. You, you know, leveraging our lack of understanding directly to the negative. Like, what's God think he's even doing? You know? Yeah. All right. Um, so I wrote this down. If there isn't another chance to rebel, then the millennial population would enter eternity without ever having chosen. There you go. True faith shows forth when given a choice and they choose to rebel. So to me, it's like it's it. And in line with that, the other things that I see going on is God's justice is perfect and comprehensive. And it seems to me that God is revealing yet again the exceeding wickedness of evil and the exceeding rightness of his final solution. Yes. I think he's in the courtroom setting of things he is showing there is no other alternative mm. other than this final place of damnation and judgment. There's no other way that this can go. And, um, and, and he's showing, and this is what's remarkable to me. This is what blows my mind. First of all, imagine being, imagine you're born halfway through that millennial reign. Yeah. Like you're born in 500 MD or whatever yeah. we call it. You know? <laughs> okay. And all of this human history has preceded you, but you've never known any of it. Yeah. How cool. You're born into a global reign of Jesus. You know nothing but perfection oh. at a global uh, governance level. Now you'll know imperfection because your parents will be sinful and you'll be sinful, but you'll know nothing but there's no poverty you know there's there's abundance there's uh peace peace there's joy i mean elation joy you know nothing but a good sovereign global president yep jesus no cockroaches nothing you know and suddenly satan can turn you yeah it's like it, it's it's in a sense, and this struck me today as I was thinking about this, it's Eden all over again. It's everything's it perfect. Is. And Satan comes along and says, hey, yeah, he's good, but he's but he's holding out on you. He's not as good as you think he is. There's more to the story. Now, I mean, here, here, I've never thought of this before. Do you think we'll be saying to them for that thousand years, warning them, saying like, he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an enemy who's going to come back. And you can't turn to, are we are going to be warning or are we going to? Uh, this is pure conjecture. Yeah. I think we'll be doing similar work to what we're doing now, but with perfect bodies and per, yes. no, without our sin natures. We'll be doing evangelistic work Yeah. in leading these and discipling these people. Wow. It's just, you know, yeah. it's just, it's amazing. It's awe inspiring that to think we'll be helping them come to Christ. Yeah. Um, but there'll be holdouts that hmm. haven't come to him and then as soon as satan gives opportunity they'll rebel you yeah. know what i like about the end of the thousand years though it's quick you know what i mean like fire oh. comes from heaven and bam <laughs> we don't have to go through this seven year thing and yeah. all the, you know it's like it's, <laughs> it's like jesus says we've already seen this movie <laughs> so we're just going to fast forward to the credits you know yeah. here it is in fast motion fire from heaven yeah. let's get the new heaven and new earth yeah at that point the case is closed Yes. Uh, there's no, there's no more need for God, you know, and he doesn't have to do what he's doing now. He doesn't have to do grace, he, mercy. He doesn't have to preach the gospel from the heavens yeah. for seven years. You know, he doesn't no. have to do any of this. His mercy endures forever. You know, his long suffering, he is so, so gracious to us. And at that point, it's the doors closed. Yeah. Yep. All right, I have one more question. 
Revelation 22, verse 2. In the, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Why do the nations need healing in the new Jerusalem? This is a really good question. And I really enjoyed studying this out. Um, so the word healing there, the Greek word is the word from which we get our word therapy. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that the translation of the word healing is in any way wrong. In fact, mo almost every modern version of the Bible uses the word healing. A couple of them use the word medicine. Okay. Okay. I don't even like medicine because medicine implies you're sick. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So think of the word healing in the sense of a sustaining kind of therapeutic provision. All right. So, and then secondly, the word nations is the word ethnos. It's the Greek word ethnos, which means ethnicities. people groups, yeah. ethnicities, races. Well, it's one race, many ethnicities. So tribes and nations and tongues and kindreds. So people groups. So this is not geopolitical in the sense that he's healing geopolitical entities. And I don't, I, I wrote this down. Um, well, let me back up. Yeah. God is, I am. That's one of his names, right? I oh, am. Yeah, yeah. Which by very definition is he is eternally self-existing and self-sustaining. You following me? Yep. God is self-existing. He depends on nothing. Self-sustaining. He needs nothing. He is totally complete in and of himself. Right? Yes. But we, even in our glorified bodies, are not that. Hmm. We are not self-existent or self-sustaining. We are always and for eternity dependent beings. So in our new bodies, wow. we will not have self-sufficiency. We will be dependent on the sustaining provision of God. That's why the scripture says, he will lead us, he will feed us. Yeah. Psalm 115 um, talks about the gods that have ears and don't, you can't hear and eyes that, you know, hands that yeah. can't, you know. Um, but scripture talks about Jesus being a God who will lead us and feed us and give us water. And Revelation 7, he will be feeding them and leading them and sheltering them. And, and we talked about that on Sunday. So the question is, what kind of healing? We know this is us. This yeah. is all these people groups. Yep. What kind of healing do we need if all of our ailments are healed and all of our wounds are healed? Can healing mean sustenance that is not recovery from some kind of from from some kind of woundedness? Hmm. And I would posit that I would say yeah. that this healing is a provision that allows us to continually flourish uh, in the presence of God, and that that tree of life and that living water is in some way a very real receiving from God. Um, so that, here's what I wrote, the healing tree, or actually this is what I copied from somebody I think, the healing tree is of life leaves, of life's leaves do not heal wounds of battle. The war is ended. They don't heal, uh, they're not needed for combating, combating sickness. There is no more sickness or death or pain. No, the healing is a reference to perpetual blessing of the new heaven and new earth, never again will the world be plagued by these kinds of disorders. Um, and we will be always f fueled by a, a flourishing provision from God. And so that's my take on wow. it. Wow. Yeah, pretty cool. You know, I think the bottom line of all this stuff, all this stuff we've discussed in Revelation is like, how good God is, <laughs> you know, how good he is more than we can imagine and and the love the love is just and the patience you know the way you just the older i get and the more wise all he gets the glory for it all i just realize he's got a plan forever and he's good you know and it just it, it will always blow my mind and i say it almost every day when i make these videos i say the same god 
you know, when G Jesus spoke and nothing became everything, and that yeah. same one came here to shed his blood, to, to pay for our sins with his blood. And I I'll never, ever get over it. I mean, we'll praise him for eternity, and it won't be enough time. To, you know, I'm saying the word time again. We're out of time, but. Yeah, and it won't be compulsory. We will want yeah. to be in his presence and to be celebrating and worshiping and praising him, and it will be unimaginably wonderful. When I was a kid, my mom would say, I'd say, Mom, what are we going to do in heaven? She'd go, we're going to praise God forever. And I was like, Sounds boring. boring. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, Mom, after 20 minutes, I'm really going to, you know, what else are we going to do there? <laughs> and now that I'm an old man, I'm like, oh, yeah, just forever. You know, yeah. it's like I'm ready. I don't even think we can imagine. I mean, obviously, Scripture says it hasn't entered into our minds, the things God's prepared for those that love him. Yeah. And I, I know there's more to it than that, you know? I mean, yeah. but um, he will be so absolutely wonderful. We won't need or want to be anywhere but in his presence. Oh, that's a good way to end this. Yeah. That's a good way to end this. All right, my brother. We that's did great. it. Two videos. I'm so glad that you guys... Uh, Watch this. I hope it blessed you. It really blessed me. You, you bless me. Well, it was great. And I just, uh, I love you guys. And we will be back soon. And, and I'm probably going to have you on more because. This was I, fun. It's fun. I enjoyed this. I, one time when we do this, I want to sit in that car seat. Though. You're going to sit in the car seat? <laughs> All right. It's just right there. It's yeah, like it's in the middle. Yeah, it's got those lollipops yeah. stuck to it. And, you know, it looks clean from the video. It would, it would keep me from having to get a crick in my neck. You know, <laughs> We have to lean pretty close into each other yeah. to do these videos. Yeah. So it's <laughs> Tom's invading my personal space here. <laughs> but we love you guys. Thanks for watching, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. God bless.